Uh, Bob, why don't we start with you? What's at stake for GM here? Well, the stake, uh, stakes really are American competitiveness. And uh, as you'll recall, after the Chapter 11 bankruptcy of General Motors, uh, the government made sure that the wages were supposed to be equal I'm to the hearing. transplants in the United States. Today, actually, they're on average, first of all, General Motors has the highest hourly pay of any, uh, any manufacturer in the United States. Secondly, the average wage is uh, $13 above that of the transplants. And that's with the, the contentious uh, temporary employees factored in. If you take the temporary employees out of the equation, the wage differential is even greater. So uh, General Motors uh, pays well, cares for its people, has great health care, put an offer on the table which uh, the, the union said at the time, if you had presented this uh, a day earlier, we would, have, we would have taken it to ratification. That offer has since then been improved, and they still won't take it to ratification. So, you know, excuse, excuse me and others for believing that uh, for some reason the union is dragging its feet on a perfectly good deal uh, because of the d distraction caused by um, all, all of the indictments for corruption and self-dealing within the union. Harley, can you hear that? Heard a thing. Just one little bit of what Bob Lutz said, and then I'm hearing myself. Oh, Harley, yeah, you're, you're getting what's called the feedback loop played back into your ear. We just need to fix the mix minus on that. What I will tell you, I don't know if you can hear me at this point, Bob kind of laid out what GM has on the line, said that GM workers get paid more than any other automaker in the United States, uh, and that they had what was a good deal that they said they would have signed a year earlier. He thinks they're dragging their feet on this. What do you think the union has at stake? The union has a lot at stake, uh, and I, I'm actually getting feedback. Okay, take it out of your ear for just a second. You can put it back in when you're done talking. I'm sorry to ask you to fix this on the fly. It's a difficult thing to do, but if you take no, it out of that, your ear, and, and say that's what you have to say and then put it back in. Sorry about that. It's the hey, spirit I, of the negotiation. I the good thing <laughs> it on the fly. We're trying to work together, right? Uh, I would have to say that and I would I am uh, also take issue with myself uh, a bit of the way talk, Bob laid out the a... cost structure. That is, GM's total compensation cost $63 versus, say, $50 for Toyota. That's true as far as it goes in the United States. But if you include Mexico and the United States, meaning if you combine those wage rates, so far this year, 92 percent of the vehicles GM made in Mexico, almost entirely SUVs and highly profitable pickups, were exported to the U.S. If you include their Mexican wage rates, which average 270 an hour, uh, GM's total wage cost for Mexico and the United States, they're all, all these vehicles are being sold in the U.S. market, is $48 an hour. Okay, Toyota, Bob. which employs one-fifth of the workers in Mexico uh, that GM does, their total wage cost is $47 an hour when you combine it like that. So the notion of GM being way out of line, if you look only at the U.S., but now production is highly integrated between both countries, and that's one of the issues that right now has derailed the, the talks in Detroit. Hey, Bob, um, let, let's talk a little bit about what this means with NAFTA. The workers there are fighting to make sure that they don't lose more of the production to either Canada or Mexico. Uh, that is an issue that sticks out. And then maybe also talk a little bit about your experience with UC Berkeley and why you and Harley may have a difference of opinions here. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I, th I think GM will survive this because in the old days, uh, they said an 11-week strike would bring GM to its knees because of the uh, drying up of the cash flow. That, that is no longer the case. Um, uh, because China produces so much of the so much of the uh, current cash flow for, and as long as China keeps operating, GM will stay alive. And to, to the good good professor's remarks, of course Mexico produces uh, a portion of the vehicles, but all an uncompetitive and increasingly uncompetitive U.S. wage cost 
simply drives more production to Mexico. That's all, that, that's all I'm saying. As far as uh, my UC Berkeley experience when I was in the business school there, I actually got out uh, with an MBA with a 3.83 grade point average, which at that time was sort of a record. Uh, but the one course I had a great deal of trouble in was taught by one of Professor Shakin's uh, predecessors called Labor Relations, uh, History of Philosophy of and so forth. And I had to write a term paper, um, and I touched on a, on a number of aspects, but because I wanted some balance, I, I wrote in it that uh, large unions um, had plenty to answer for when it came to the loss of um, uh, competitiveness of American industry. Uh, I got a D on that paper, and it was heavily red circled, and, and in, the, in the margin it says you obviously haven't been paying attention in class and so forth. So it was it was not popular, um, but then I've never tried to be popular.